Welcome to Indianomics. As India's G20 presidentship comes to a close, what are India's achievements in the past one year? Is there a plan to make the multilateral development banks work better for low-income countries and climate change? And what is the state of the global economy with the Fed continuing to tighten? How bad is the China slowdown? For all these very critical questions, I have with me one most appropriate to answer them. Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanian, India's former Chief Economic Advisor and now Executive Director representing India on the IMF Board. Dr. Subramanian, thank you very much indeed for joining us in our studio. My pleasure, Lata. Thank you. Well, let me start with, you know, this G20 and the World Leaders Summit. Uh, what is the signal achievement? I would rank uh, at least two or three very key achievements. Let me start with uh, the global uh, debt restructuring roundtable. If we look at the global economy, uh, debt distress is a very key issue. The common framework uh, that uh, had existed within the G20 had some issues with it, especially the fact that it was not applicable to some of the middle-income countries like Sri Lanka, for instance. Um, secondly, you know, over the last decade and especially post-COVID, uh, many creditors that are outside the Paris Club have become dominant. Um, and, and these countries are ones where the decision-making process, especially with respect to debt restructuring, has been slow because it tends to be centralized, it tends to be sometimes opaque as well. And as you would appreciate, Lata, you know, in any situation of debt restructuring, time is of essence. Um, and I think in this uh, particular case, the Global Debt Restructuring Roundtable, I think will be a telling contribution that India will make um, by expanding it to countries that are beyond the, you know, the current, fra the common framework, um, and also bringing in processes that will actually ensure that decision making will be fast. Um, so that I think I would rank as the, you know, the most important contribution. Second, and I think this is something the contribution of which will be there uh, over time, is demonstrating and taking the leadership, you know, in technology being for the, you know, for common good, but across the board. Um, and, and I think what better country than India to demonstrate this? Uh, just recently, we saw, you know, over 500 million accounts being created, in Jandhana Bank, you know, account. So uh, this initiative for financial inclusion, and I think India having already done it, um, will be taking the leadership, uh, the global forum for financial inclusion. Uh, relatedly, also the public digital infrastructure, yes. um, and I think especially the way in which we handled COVID, the demand side push that we gave was, was very well targeted because we relied on this public digital infrastructure. So showing that public digital infrastructure can be used in times of crisis, but also in good times to, to enable productivity you know, improvements, I think that will be a second contribution in general showing technology for, for the you know, broader good. Also, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, in terms of an idea, this idea of life, which is lifestyle for environment, I think, it's, you know, the impact of this will be seen over time because, you know, this has been in part of India's ethos where not only do we talk about, you know, economic growth, but we also talk about economic growth in a sustainable manner. And the idea of life is therefore, I think, you know, uh, exemplification of that ethos. So altogether, if we put, you know, I think uh, it'll be a telling contribution um, uh, which will be consistent with the kind of stature that India now brings in the global uh, you know, economy. Oh, absolutely. I think the last point you make is uh, well taken. Uh, Indian ethos always appreciates man as part of nature yes. and not man over nature. Correct. You Correct. know, the jivas, jivo jivas se bojanam kind right. of uh, uh, place that the human uh, species has. Okay, let me come to, uh, you know, you touched upon the debt restructuring and obviously China is a big factor in that. Uh, but China itself is bedeviled with this debt deflation loop. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, in your perch uh, at the IMF, you will be better able to educate us. How serious is that problem? Uh, do you see a prolonged Chinese slowdown? I actually fear that, Lata. Um, because uh, some of the problems that the Chinese economy now is facing is structural. Um, and I think it's a twofold problem. First is the, is the demographics. Uh, if you, you know, rewind back to the 1980s, um, you know, China was, was basically looking at a demographic dividend. Um, you know, huge increase in the working, uh, you know, population. But over the next two decades, uh, the, that working population is going to decline by about 300 million. Oh. 300 million. You know, that's, that's a huge. very, very that's large fifth number. fifth of the population. Yes. Um, 
and you know that will of course then lead you know lead to loss of competitiveness because you know the economic model that china has pursued is one of you know utilizing the large population as a, a, a big strength but wages will go up because you know supply of you know uh, w- workforce will will de- decline but at the same time uh, you know one of the things that china has been trying to do uh, after the global financial crisis which is to enhance domestic consumption uh, the decline in this you know working population will also not help but I, there's a bigger problem that i think uh, is something that they have to contend with and this is something that you know india went through but has you know emerged very successfully which is the financial sector yes um now you know if you look at china china's growth happened through investment you know at its peak for instance they were touching investment as a proportion of gdp close to 50% 48% to be precise um but some of that has led to a lot of bad investment as well and as we've seen in india itself when you actually do not clean up the balance sheets very quickly that leads to evergreening of loans that leads to zombie lending and as i've always maintained you know uh, you know with you and elsewhere whenever problems start from the financial sector the overhang of that is very very long and because a lot of the lending you know whether it's to the real estate whether it is actually to the municipalities have all been done by institutions with soft budget constraints you know not hard budget constraints uh, some of the opac you know opacity that prevails actually will mean that the restructuring of these balance sheets clean up of that may not happen in- immediately and that is why i think uh, you know i i fear that some of the problems the demographics together with the sort of the investment model having run its course now yes. i think means that the problems are structural yes over invested over supplied and over leveraged over leveraged no. and i think over leveraged exactly the way in which india faced which is both you know corporates you know banks but also some of the real estate sector as well i think so you know uh, i think that to me is the is the sort of worry in terms of the uh, next se- several years but the demographics will certainly be a big big headwind that structure uh, yeah how they are able to delever the local governments and the local government financial vehicles is uh, perhaps uh, the uh, the big question yes. but now that brings us to what it means for us so do you think that this is a disinflationary force mm-hmm. uh, to that extent do you think people like india don't have to worry at least about core inflation um so that's a very good question um i think overall if you look at um, the chinese deflation i think will mean good news for uh, inflation you know or fighting inflation globally mm. because um if you look at you know many of the advanced economies whether it's the united states or europe a lot of their you know uh, imports and especially some of the consumption comes from china and to that extent actually the deflation in china will help in easing some of these inflationary pressures um i think if for india as well you know it 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 will help uh, but i would also you know f- uh, note that combined with this good news i think there is some you know sort of worrying news on the supply side on crude front uh, you know i think with the us or uh, you know strategic oil reserves sort of really dipping um, and you know uh, uh, russia and saudi arabia actually i think at least for the for the for this year putting a squeeze on supply i think uh, crude oil price so so there are sort of uh, competing pressures here okay. i think the demand side there's good news because uh, on the inflation front at yes. least um, because the deflation in china will uh, will help but i think the supply is mitigating that that good news on the no, demand i agree side. i agree we do have bad news or at least difficult news in terms of fuel and food yes and uh, this perhaps is a small mitigant correct but let me come therefore to the heart of the problem or you know the global cost of money which the us decides in a way yeah uh, what's your sense uh, uh, the latest ism numbers services numbers are still very strong mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so uh, one more rate hike still uh, there if not september sometime my sense is the rate uh you know tightening or the monetary tightening cycle may be coming to an end in the us um so if you look at the you know the signals that are coming out in the united states the sort of conflicting on the one hand you have goldman sachs saying that the probability of recession has declined from 20% to 15% yeah. at the same time you have bloomberg saying that the probability of re- recession is more than half so two you know commentators <laughs> saying opposite things similarly if you look at the, the the labor data you know on the one hand the last prints showed that more than 180000 jobs created overall 
But if you look at, you know, sort of uh, open the hood and start looking, about 20% of metros are actually seeing, uh, you know, unemployment rates that are, you know, are at one-year highs yes. compared to the, you know, uh, the lows that were there. And these account for about one quarter of overall employment. So even on employment, the macro versus the sort of the, the micro seems to be at conf in, in conflict. But I think the uh, other key fact that I would look at is, is the fact that M2, you know, which is basically what the U.S. uses uh, to, to measure broad money, uh, has declined for the first time in 70 years. Okay. Um, I think that is something which I would actually, you know, uh, uh, combining it with, uh, you know, the book that we have, Money as Zero Sum Game, if you bring some of those ideas in, I think it's good news on the inflation front because actually there'll be less money chasing goods. Um, but at the same time, the decline in the broad money, a large part of that is coming from bank lending, not, 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 not increasing. And that is something which actually we'll have to wait and watch because it could actually mean if bank lending is declining, that may be that some corporates may not be able to continue the refinancing their loans. Uh, to what extent that leads to, you know, possible distress on the corporate side, that is something that will have to be wait and, you know, one, one has to wait and watch. At the same time, even on the banking sector, the discount window that the Fed had brought in March after the, some of the, you know, uh, 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 bank, bank uh, problems that they saw, those, you know, we'll have to wait because it was a one-year window and come uh, March of 2024, my senses will have to be actually, you know, the can will have to be sort of kicked down the road for one more year at least because rates have not declined as much as they would have wanted for some of the book losses actually to be, to be sort of, you know, uh, retrieved. So I think I would say cautiously uh, um, sort of optimistic on the U.S. side. Europe, though, you know, if you look at, um, so on the one hand, if you look at inflation, 3.2% was the latest print in the U.S., 5.3% in Europe. Uh, growth last, you know, second quarter, 2.1% in the U.S., only 0.6% in, in Europe. So I think Europe is, is, you know, tighter spot. And as I was saying with China, I think Europe also has structural problems. So growth may continue to be anemic, anemic there. Um, so overall, I think uh, uh, global economy, is facing headwinds. Okay. That's 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 my sense. But I think India, uh, you know, uh, is is in a good spot. Oh yes, it is, and we have to get much more out of you from what to make of the Indian situation in a minute after a break.